Welcome. Here is a talk on uh, replacing core infrastructure without disrupting the community, the VLC way, by Jeffroy Kupri. Thank you. So, just which guide? So, yeah, let's talk about infrastructure and a bit about VLC. Uh, I do security stuff at a company called Clever Cloud with, we with web hosting, like push your code and it runs. And I will talk about why it goes into the everything I've been working on in the past few years. And I work also on VLC. VLC is the project that introduced me to open source work. I've been there like since nearly 10 years now. So I had lots of ideas and feelings about how the project can uh, evolve and it's I will show you now what's driven me for the past few years so first thing like who's developer here who develops yeah so it's cool to build new code start from scratch a new project write whatever I want in whatever language I want I can have the last version of the framework and what and it will be cool I could just deploy and it works and maybe I'll maintain that or not but there's a huge, huge amount of old code that we use. And they have some common patterns. Like see Zlib. Zlib is a compression algorithm library. It was started in 1995. There's only one ma main maintainer. Like there are a few contributors, but there's one person working like nearly, uh, doing nearly on all the commits. The last line is, to get like reverse dependencies on, on Zlib on Debian, like thousands of packets. And then there are also transitive dependencies to come and whatever. So this is one of the packets that has, that's at the core of what we build in our, uh, in our distributions. In 2017, we had like four vulnerabilities. Uh, some interesting things like, uh, Complexity low, access remote, basically you send a file and there's an issue with the CRC. And uh, this one was, was that a remote code execution? Uh, yeah, they said unspecified impact at each time. But basically, we still have vulnerabilities in that software that's like, uh, how much now? 20, 20 years old? Uh, maybe you heard about DNS mask this year who has same thing, one maintainer, started in early 2000s. And uh, the Google Project Zero made, some, uh, aud made an audit of that software and found a lot of flaws in there. And they started to help him try to fix that. Another one is image magic. Like whenever you want to do image conversion in whatever you like, every web framework has a library somewhere, a package that can use image magic to like rediment. What? Wasn't that port to graphics magic? Uh, yeah, maybe. That's my impression that everybody's using graphics magic now. Yeah, uh, so maybe. Maybe you get more of our defense on graphics magic. Oh. Does someone has a Ubuntu on Debian and want to, yeah, to, to, to run the command? I think there is still a form of a image Yeah, yeah. And we, we got like this one, this one, rule, like, they, they like to put logos on stuff now. And this was what was fun because basically Image Magic was 15. 15? Uh, but the, the thing with uh, difference with Image Magic and uh, Zlib, Zlib is a library. Image Magic is just a lot used like as a binary you call and lots of uh, like web applications just shell out to Image Magic to do stuff, which will be an incredibly bad practice at some point. And Image Magic was just not verifying what the, the image was made of and was executing code directly. And a last one that maybe you've heard about. There are more maintainers, five people. Now, at some point there were not that many it's used everywhere. Like there are other TLS implementations, but let's face it, OpenSSL is the one that's used the most. 
And we got this one nice vulnerability called Hardgrid, where you basically send the packet to, to the server and say, OK, give me this, this many bytes of the memory, and the server sends you back the, 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 the data. This is fine. Everything's fine. We're not in a burning room. Everything is OK or not. So my point is not that those developers suck. It's the contrary. They have some constraints, and they do an amazing job. And how can we make sure that the software will turn out OK in those constraints? The common patterns we have is like basically most of them were starting in the 90s. They written in C. There has been, until now, nearly no funding for the developers. Only one maintainer or a few. And it's everywhere. Everybody wants to use that software. Nobody wants to maintain that. And you have, you have to know like a lot of those like were mostly fine for, for years. But now people are, are looking for vulnerabilities more and more in the, in the software. And what, what's the, the conclusion they have? Well, we did not find vulnerabilities before because we did not go looking for them. Some of those were there like for years and it's just nobody took the time to do that. So what can we do to have like stronger infrastructure, stronger basic building blocks? There, there's one point that's at the center of what uh, the issue I have with the, the, those projects and the impact they have. We're stuck with them. Like 20 years from now, 20 years from now, we will still hear about OpenSSL. It will still be there. Zlib2, ImageMagic2, like we, still, we will still have them 20 years from now. Because 20 years from now, people will continue building things with them. But there will also be some code that's been written now that will still be used at the time. Because there's a compounding effect. When people start using something, they start using more and more and more. And it's hard to make them switch to a new solution. We cannot replace them with new solutions. This will not work. Because you have to, to change the ways for everybody. There's another point around those, library, those libraries. I said, like, started in the 90s. Uh, there, there's a, a nice trivia about OpenSSL. Uh, it's, it was a self-learning project at the beginning. Someone that wanted to learn uh, C and crypto and said, OK, I will do OpenSSL and it would be a cool project. And then in, it became that monster that's everywhere and that's powering most of the web servers in the world. So we cannot know which one will turn out to be our basic building, building blocks. You cannot engineer something to be, OK, this will be at the basis of everything we will do for the next 50 years. Because if you do that, you end up with bloated uh, software that's like trying to, to be designed for all of the use cases. It does not work. So from there, how can we make sure that we have building blocks that are safe? The issue is cost, mainly. Because fixing the code will be costly. Making sure everybody gets the new code, the correct code, is costly too. So we want to find a way to, to fix our infrastructure right now without breaking everything. Because the cracks are showing. Like For years, we've been using everything, and it's been fine because nobody was looking. We were too stuck trying to find remote code execution in TCP stacks in the, in the, in the operating systems. Now people are, are going to watch at those software. Uh, I come from VLC, and it's interesting for me too, because VLC, like um, one of the first software you, you install on a new machine, is the media player. It's a great, great, great vector to infect a machine. So since browsers made worked a lot on their security. Now people are shifting to things like media player or those kind of library. We have to make things better. We cannot do everything from scratch. This will not work. 
How many of you have been in a project where someone said, OK, let's do everything from scratch, and we'll do it right this time, and then it turned out OK? I don't know for you. I tried that a few times. And th then I got, I wouldn't say I got smarter, but uh, now I know better. Uh, the thing is, once you, when you rewrite a project, you have some knowledge you carry on, but there's something you will lose. Like, I could try to rewrite the whole VLC code, but there's a lot of intelligence, a lot of knowledge in the code that's not necessarily um, evident in the mind of the programmer. It's just, OK, the code has been architectured that way over time because this is how it worked. And someone will try to do it better and ignore that there were some issues for this device somewhere. We will end up reproducing all the old bugs. And the big issue is like, if you do a new project from scratch, then you have two projects. And then you have to wait for everybody to upgrade. And this will not happen because people will upgrade at some point and others don't. And you have to maintain both of them for like the next 50 years. So let's find a more effi efficient way to fix stuff. The thing is, even if the software uh, have lots of issues, like they were basically not, they were, they were untouched by uh, the security approaches we have now. And so there, there's lots of stuff that are easy to do. Uh, I don't know. I talked about uh, image magic. What would you do right now to try and strengthen image magic? What's the most cost effective way to find the bugs in that software? you will throw some CPU at it. Just first the sheet of the software. It's, it's the most cost-effective effect, cost way to find bugs right now. Because it's extremely easy. And this is what Google has been doing. This is what Microsoft has been doing. They, they just put, they, they, they found a shitload of machines and decided, OK, they will just try to crash the software over and over and over and over and over until it gets better. So this is useful for everybody. In VLC, we had before a project called Zuf, ZZUF, uh, which it's a very, very, uh, very stupid further. It just randomly changed stuff. Uh, and like, it already found a lot of issues. It was very funny to just come up to the developer and say, OK, I have this, uh, this file that does not work. Uh, can you take a look? And the developer says, OK, this is not real. Your bug is not real. It cannot happen. And then I give the file. Ah, yeah, it's real. No, it should not. Because the further has uh, a view, has the real view of the software. Because the developer has the view from the source code and has their own mod mental model of the code. But when the code is compiled, it's something else. Uh, right now, there's AFL, American Fuzzilop, which is a really, really amazing soft because it can adapt itself to the target. Uh, there was a really good example where they started with a file that's one byte, was a zero of something, and then they started to fudge lead PNG. And uh, the fudger ended up creating a complete PNG file like, uh, that follows the specific and specification and everything, because it tries every path in the code. And then so at some point, the, the, the file it was, that was made was like a real image, and that was still trying to crash uh, libpng. This is much cheaper than writing unit tests. Like, I talk a lot with people that uh, talk about good practice in code, and say, you have to write unit tests, and I say, fuck that, I will just send the CPU and let the CPU write the test. So this is a very, very nice way to fix issues, to find issues. Yeah, you still have to fix the code. Another cost-effective way is sandboxing. This is something that's been investigated in lots of softwares. Uh, like you've seen, most browsers are working on sandboxing, even Firefox right now has some kind of sandboxing. We are currently evalu evaluating that for VLC. Because most of so some parts of the code like, do not need the same access as others. Like in VLC, the part that passes the file and decodes the video 
does not need network access, does not need file access, because the file is read by another part of the code. So you could just put that in a process, that sandbox that does not access, have access to anything. And if that process crashes because someone finds a vulnerability, there's nothing useful in that process. Because you know there will be bugs. Even if you try to fix stuff, you know you will get more and more bugs. So right now, a good way to contain the, the issue is to sandbox. Uh, it's not easy, honestly, because it needs a lot of tests. Uh, there are lots of ways to do that, like some people do AC Linux, overwrite uh, seccom policies. Uh, there are lots of hacks to do on Windows to have some kind of sandboxing. Mac OS ships with some kind of sandboxing that's kind of working, but they don't really like multi-process stuff. Still, it's good to investigate. So, these are easy ways. Now there's something I've been trying to do in VLC. An actual rewrite. Because uh, VLC, the idea is find whatever file, video, audio, or network stream and whatever, it will decode that thing. What happens when you want to decode everything that every ever existed, even the stuff that does not follow specifications, and you write all your parsers and decoder in C or assembly? You have a shitload of bugs. So I wanted to find a way to, to get stronger parsers. And I got like a kind of strategy to do that. So the idea is I do not want to rewrite the whole VLC. This does not make any sense. So I want to write small, small, small parts that keep the same API to avoid uh, breaking the rest of the code, annoying the developers, and making sure that the, the, the upgrade is like easy and will not affect anything important. And the best target for that is parsers. Parsers as, are very well contained. Like you send data, they give you back structure. They are mostly deterministic. So you can just put that write that in any language or put that in any process, and it should be easy to, to, to wrap. It's also the weakest part of most software, because this is where the attacker comes in first. The data will come from there, and it's extremely hard to write correct passes in C, and it's extremely annoying to maintain them, because once you have lots of pointer arithmetic, you don't want to go back into that code. Like, uh, I could show you some codes for like the MKV files and the kind of thing in, in VLC, and it's, it's a mess. Uh, from there, I got into um, a community that's quite interesting, a research community called Langsec. Uh, Langsec is a research workshop that uh, has one approach to security. They look at your program uh, as some kind of virtual machine for which the input data is the bytecode. The virtual machine is executing a language, and the attacker is, is sending you that language. What can the attacker do with your virtual machine? And so there has been a lot of work to define what kind of grammar is there in the input language. Like if you have um, a grammar that's more than context-free, it will be a lot easier to do to, to do a lot of things with your software and it will be hard to edit. If you have regular or, or context-free language, maybe the attacker can still do a lot of things, but it's much, much, much easier to, to pass and to, to contain. And so it influenced a lot the thing I wanted. I wanted for VLC a way to write passer that, were, that would be memory safe. Uh, there would be no garbage collection because there's a huge cost with that. I know because I've tried to replace the passers with Haskell at first, and it was quite fun to do, but it was fucking slow. Uh, Haskell is really good like for server, server stuff, and, but for VLC it was really not a good fit. I wanted something that can map to C code very easily, and that could be like as fast as C or nearly as fast. You not need to be like the fastest thing, like the, um, in VLC, you want the codecs to be extremely fast, but the, the parsers do not need to be the fastest thing ever. Because 
the, the time spent will be mostly in decoding, not in parsing anyway. And so I end up with Rust. Maybe you've heard about that language that Mozilla is, has been pushing for the past few years. So Rust is a language that is design, that's designed to be memory safe. That has zero cost abstractions. That's the idea is the compiler will check a lot of things at compile time, but they will not have any cost at runtime. Like making sure that memory is safe, that there are no uh, double freeze and that kind of thing. Everything is checked at compile time, and you will be guaranteed there will not be issue, there will not be issues like that at runtime. They make sure there's no data race. There are like lots of uh, features from language like Jenkins and whatever that are really useful. It's kind of a high-level language, but for low-level development. It's really good to talk to C, like you can have good CFFI, like you can call into C code, but you can also be called by C code. You can easily export a function that has the same ABI as a C1. It's extremely useful for that. And it's memory safe without garbage collection. So let's rewrite everything in Rust. Yeah, I'm one of those people that come up and say, yeah, maybe you should rewrite that in Rust. And uh, there was a, it was a joke in the community because uh, People outside of the Rust community were looking at us and saying, yeah, you, you always, there's always come, someone coming up and saying you should rewrite that in Rust. And the fact is, people in the Rust community were not doing that because we do not want to, to, to be hassles. And it, it was always people from other community that heard about Rust and thought it was cool and said, you should do that in Rust, but they did not even write one. But the thing is, people didn't know that we were actually rewriting a lot of things. And now, now they're, they're realizing that uh, like Firefox is shipping with a lot of Rust code and will be shipping with more now. And it will only increase. The thing I've been focused on is parsers. I wrote this small library called NOM. It's a parser combinators library, like Parsec in Haskell and other kind of... Uh, of this. The idea is like you have small functions that you will combine to make larger and smarter parsers. Instead of having like a huge grammar you write that will, be that will be used to generate code, you have like small parts that can be tested in independently. It's quite easy to use. Um, a funny thing with, with Rust is that since the compiler knows who owns which part of the data at, at any point, I thought, hey, I can do zero copy parsing, where at the end I just send a, a pointer to a part of the, the data that I have to return, instead of copying it because that should be extremely fast, right? And it, it is. And it's easy to write extremely safe parser. They've been fuzzed to death. It's hard now to, to trigger some bugs in non parsers. And they are competitive with C parsers. And so I got to work in VLC. The idea right now for my work is I find the format, I look at the spec, I weep because file format specifications are wrong. There's a joke in the media community that say, okay, everybody has uh, an extremely strong idea of how th you should write uh, a file format, and they are all wrong. Uh, only I'm, I'm right. Um, and so, and the thing is, you have specifications that are wrong because people will like just select what they want to follow in that, even if there's must or must not and whatever, they will just do whatever. And you, at some point you have, to, you have to support all of those broken implementations. Or they will have like slightly different interpretations of parts of the, the specification. So it's a complete mess. So I find a nice little format. Uh, the first one I did was FLV. It's quite cool with NOM. I, I had a, like an early complete parser in two hours. It's, uh, it's easy to do. Like the format is really, really small. I can test it in Rust, I can't fudge it in Rust, and the uh, usability is much, much, much higher than C code for that. So I test that in Rust, and then I write the, um, the wrapper in C to call that from, uh, from C code. So this FLV parser, I then wrap that in the VLC plugin that I wrote in Rust completely. I can just make a library, a DLL from uh, that uh, VLC plugin, Push, push that inside the, the VLC uh, folder and it will work directly because I can export the exact same API, same API as, uh, as C code. And 
since the parser is in Rust, it can be used in over Rust project. It, can, it has been reused by people from the JStreamer projects, like they have been doing a lot of Rust recently. Uh, I've been having fun trying to make that work with Web, uh, WebAssembly, because at some point people will want to just decode video in WebAssembly, and I'm just writing the tools for them. And the point is, it's very, very small, very self-contained. I do not affect most of the code in VLC. I do not need to go into the threading code and rewrite everything because I know I will not get it right. And believe me, I tried and I made it, made it very, very wrong at some point. Um, it's just a small, small part of the code that I can rewrite. And it's easy to modify. And it does not affect the parts that are interesting in VLC on with that and that uh, give the most value to people. Like, I don't need to rewrite the, the, the UI. We have something, some code with Qt, or I don't know, like uh, macOS, what we're using right now. I do not need to write that code. We have toolkit for that that are quite good. And this is where people get the most value. There's no value in parsers, but we still have to get them right. So let's find a small, easy way to write them. The hard part is how to integrate that in the build system, like making sure that Rust will work with auto tools and whatever. Mm. Not that I'm talking about Rust because this is the solution as I'm finding right now, but there will be other languages like Rust. It's the first like mainstream language with that kind of features. There will be other languages that we could use to do that in the future. Uh, there's another example that's been quite interesting is Suricata. Uh, so if you've never heard about it, Suricata is an uh, IDS. It looks at network streams and try to find attacks and stuff. And they made all of their parsers in C. And at some point, so someone from the Suricata project comes, comes to me on IRC. Like, I don't know who he was. He comes to me and says, OK, I've been writing parsers. I have these questions about norm. How do you do this and that? And from the first question, I say, OK, you're doing something extremely advanced. Please tell me what you're doing. And I will not answer you until you tell me. The guy was writing a TLS parser. He was, it was Pierre Chiffier, the one who wrote the original C pa TLS parser inside uh, Suricata. And since then, they wrote MTP, SNMP, uh, DR, a shitload of formats. And they found a way to integrate some Rust in Suricata for, for their parsing. And it's quite interesting because they do not want to have like a, uh, a parser that follows specification. They want to have a parser that recognizes, OK, I got this type of packet. But this part is invalid, so I will, just, I will not just return an error. I will just, OK, I got this packet, and this is a part where I should give you a value, but instead I will just give you the bytes so you can look at it afterwards. So it's designed to handle invalid data and attack data. And they, are, they are the same process. They just want to rewrite small parts and do not affect most of the code. They had to make some new APIs in the C code to, to handle Rust, but mostly it was quite easy. And now they have the infrastructure to do that for a lot of, lot of formats. So uh, maybe I have to be a bit faster now. This was the technical part. We are engineers. We think we will fix the world with, techno with code. And this is how we fix social issues. We write code. No, it does not. Because even if you're going to a project and say, OK, I wrote some stuff, there's still only one maintainer that will not give a shit after a month and the code we wrote. You have to fund the development. This is the hard part. How do you make sure that there will be enough maintainers and that they will not get burnt out on their work? Because let's face it, op open source work is built on unpaid labor. I, ha I have the, the, the luck to, to be working on open source full time and being paid for that. But it's not on that kind of project that's extremely useful to everybody. So how do we make sure that they will get money? Like donations, whatever. Video land works a bit like that. People donate money to the video organization because they like VLC. But that money can be used to, uh, to fund a lot, lot of software. Like, who heard about libdvdnav and that kind of thing? This is software that's at the basis of most media players for the DVD stuff. Libdvdnav is for the navigation menus, 
libdvd CSS, I think it's for the crypto part. Uh, libbd plus is the Java virtual machine inside uh, Blu-ray decoders. Mm. This is code you do not hear about, but it's everywhere. And there are like mo mostly one or two people working on that, but they still have to be maintained. Videoland is in a position to give money to fund that kind of thing. Uh, we, are also have an, we also have an event every year uh, in Paris, in more, more or less September. That's the Videoland Developer Days. At first, it was just a meeting of the VLC developers, but then it became an event for open source media work. And we got people from FFmpeg and LibAV, from Google, from uh, all the new codec developers. Like there are always new codecs appearing. And we are planning stuff. We're making sure that we, everybody goes into the right direction. And having the money for that is extremely important. Uh, the project I've been talking about before, like OpenSSL, they have that kind of funding now. There's something called the Core Infrastructure Initiative uh, that got money from the likes of Google and like, other big companies to get to fund some work on core projects like OpenSSL, OpenSSH, new PG. Um, a, uh, an important part is the reproducible builds. So they want to make sure that when, so when you get a binary packet for like Debian or something, you can build that same packet at home, like right to the, to the bits. It will be the exact one. Because you, do, you want to trust the person who makes the builds, uh, but sometimes the builds are just there's this file that they have to write manually to put in there and whatever, and so, and so you do not know at the end if you got the right project. And so uh, I think after a few months, they had the, like 80% of the packets that were working correctly. Most of, mostly to make things reproducible is removing things like uh, the date that appears in the, in, the, in the code. Like some people like to have like the, the compile date somewhere and you remove that kind of thing and it, make it, it makes it more reproducible. So, this is funding for our basic building blocks. Core infrastructure. This is really the, the work. Like this is what is at, at the basis of everything. Every server that you, you deploy anywhere will have OpenSSH. Or if you still connect to your servers with Tenet, I have bad news for you. But this is things that have to be maintained. The issue is uh, for most projects, you cannot fund that kind of work. You do not have like big organizations. The big issues with projects like uh, Zlib and other, like there's mostly one maintainer. It's a very small project, and it's not. It might not be used by, by like thousands of other projects, but it, it will be a transitive dependencies of tens of thousands of projects, and nobody will care. Like you've seen uh, people doing like a Patreon or something to fund the development and then they will get like 100 euros per month. There's a guy in the Rust community has been working like the code that's at the basis of most of the video game stuff, and he got like 300 euros per month, and the guy sh should be getting like thousands of euros per, per month for that, because it's extremely important work. But nobody knows because his code is always hidden, hidden around uh, inside the, the game engines for which people get money. Hmm. If, if it looks like it, this whole situation makes, makes me a bit angry, it's because I am angry with that. We have to fix that kind of thing. Okay? There's one last issue. We talk about the technical part. How you write the new code, how we will fix it, and how we make sure that it will, it will be maintained. But there's the last mile. Okay, people will have to actually use the code. And this is one of the biggest issues we have right now, how to make sure that uh, the code will be upgraded. Okay, we have Linux distributions that have a package manager and whatever, and you, we all know that all of the Linux servers that we have everywhere are always up to date. People maintain most of the servers the old way. It's this huge mutable state, and if you do something wrong on the machine, it's basically done. You have to do that from scratch because you broke something. And so the only way is making sure you do not upgrade very often and you, you are very careful and you plan to do that on specific date to make sure that 
there will be no issue. And then when you have to manage like hundreds of servers like that, you end up not upgrading anything. And I know I work at a web hosting company and we even saw a few of our own servers that were like years behind some upgrades. So you have to find good solutions. And this is where I will try to sell you something, but bear with me a bit. Containers, IT automation, oh, all that cloud stuff. So containers, I do not like containers because they've been, there's been a lot of hype around that, but they provide one thing that's useful. They isolate the file system. The thing that's annoying when you change a server is you change the file system and you break something and some other things rely on that and then the whole server is done. If you have small part of file system that are isolated from each other and you can upgrade them independently, it's ma it makes things much, much, much easier to, uh, to manage. You can pull up a new container with the new code and if it doesn't work, get back to the old one. There's still a lot of work to do, like garbage collection of your containers and whatever, but it works. It's not the best isolation mechanism because there are still lots of security issues and they're being worked on. Uh, like in our company, we do virtual machines. Like uh, even if you have a Docker container or whatever, it will run in its own virtual machine. When you pull up a new version of the code, you get a new version, uh, a new virtual machine built from scratch and we just drop the old one because modifying a running server is a very, very bad idea. This is what has been done on smartphones. You application or Android or iOS applications have been sandboxed kind of that way. This is why you can uh, install or delete Android applications and they there will be basically no impact on the rest of the system. IT automation, buzzwords, I think it's, oh yes, yeah, I, I have it there. Making sure everything runs smoothly and without humans, like there will be humans in the loop, but there are things for which you can just automate stuff. Zero downtime deployment. Okay, I will pull up a new version of the code. And if it's working, I remove the old one. If it's not, I keep the old one. This is not something you will do manually because what you want is agility. You want to be able to upgrade stuff over and over and over and over. Uh, there's a joke my colleagues have is that whenever I go, I go into a plane to get somewhere, there will be an open cell vulnerability. And like for hard bleed, it happened. Like I was in the, in the, the, the bus to, to getting to the airport and I see people on Twitter getting a bit fidgety. Like you know there are some back channels in the security community. So when the, there's a big vuln coming up, you see people are a bit, uh, uh, it's interesting, I cannot talk about it, but uh, be careful. <laughs> and it happened for Poodle. And like, even now when I came here, like, when I landed here in Oslo, I got a message from a colleague like there were two CVs that, that were published like Friday or something. I was just, fuck that. <laughs> Never let me get a plane, a plane ever. Be, be careful on Monday because I fly back and there might be something else coming up next. And so what happens when you have these big vuln's that appear and you cannot plan for them? Like it's not, okay, I must upgrade this PostgreSQL version at some point, no. You have hard bleed, all, you, you have to, to change all your keys, you have to upgrade all your servers. It takes something like two hours to redeploy all the infrastructure on Clever Cloud. We push a button, okay, there's the new upgrade and everything will be replaced automatically. You need that kind of agility because otherwise you just end up with old code that stays there over, over and over. Like the Equifax hack, it was an old Apache Struts vulnerability it's been there for like months, years. You need to mot automate stuff. And this is the part that's complex because like getting into that kind of automation is not cheap. But when you build new systems now, you have to think about that. You cannot handle machines and servers the way we did in the 90s. It's not possible now. Uh, it will still be hard to do for some systems. Like for VLC on Windows, we have uh, some upgrade code that runs automatically. Uh, Chrome has something like that, Firefox too. Uh, you can do that also on, uh, on Mac OS. Most software do not have infrastructure to upgrade and then they will just rot in the machines. It's now the responsibility of the developer of software to make sure that people can upgrade easily and automatically. 
all this should be easy, there's one part that really freaks me out right now. It's the Internet of Things. Because people build those things and they do not think about how they will upgrade because they will just say, okay, let's drop the thing once uh, after a year or two and we'll not upgrade it. Like even, even phones. Some, some, some phone makers, after a year or two, they just stop sending upgrades for the code. But there are, there, are, there are objects that you cannot even upgrade, you cannot change the firmware. They just ship with that old Linux version, with an old OpenSSL version, and they make sure it kind of works, but then you cannot upgrade anything. I do not know what we can do with that, but we'll most likely spend the next decades complaining about IoT that we cannot upgrade. Like, before it was core infrastructure for the internet and stuff, now it will be in our house, in our cars, I everywhere, in every machine. I do not know how we can fix those. We have to maintain all of this. So, make sure that the upgrades are easy. Make sure that even if there's regression, you can, we can handle that, like zero downtime deployment and whatever. And we have to get faster at fixing things in production. So this is it. Now you have to go and fix code, because I cannot be the only one doing that. It's not possible. I, I'm too tired now. Uh, I'm going to conference and partying. It does not help me ship good code. It's easy for the most part, like you take a software you use, you make a script to start a fuzzer, you put that on a machine sof somewhere like an old laptop that's dusting up in, in your office or whatever. Like I know someone in the Rust community who basically did that. He took, he took a ThinkPad that was uh, just somewhere in the, in the Mozilla office and people come over and say, oh, can you fuzz that? And then the thing will run like for, the, for a week and we come back with the result, okay, I have a gigabyte of files that will crash your software. Have fun. We have to work on small, small parts because we do not want to disrupt the way the project is done. We just want to, to take the annoying part that's complex to maintain and get that out of the hand of the developer so they can focus on the interesting parts. We have to make sure they get enough money for their work. And we have to make sure that the last mile where the, the actual device, the devices are, people can upgrade easily. And the thing is, I can sound a bit afraid, a bit alarmist about that is because I am, because we have to do that right now. We do not have the time to wait for people to fix, that, to fix stuff for uh, like 10 years or more. We have to start now. This is why People, people like at uh, the Project Zero at Google are working on finding rules in common software right now because they identified the same issue. So if there are, there's some software you use that's used everywhere, take some time to take a look at it and see how you can help them improve without like burning them out. Okay? And since I've been a bit... Uh, talking about sad things and angry things, here's something to, to make you happy. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Or we can just put a diff. Yeah? Yeah? And did, okay. Yeah, and you have to have like, an interest in social labor. You must make sure that you have artists and you have bars and stuff. And people talk about it and it gets some steam. And that's why hackerspaces work as well. Hackerspaces, I think, is so much, you know, the, the, there's a cultural difference between funders mm. and people working on the project yeah. a lot of the time. So this is the thing. You have to make a, a communication interface that works well. Mm. Right. And you know how to do that. 
Mm -hmm. So, if you come back, yeah. Ah, yeah, I definitely will. You, you had a question. You're going back, but I think you had the questions, no? Rewrite the whole software? Uh, yeah, there are. And um, like I know someone that's working on a project called ImageFlow, which is a kind of image magic, but built in Rust and C++ with from the ground up. Because like right now, I'm not sure we will be able to fix the whole image magic. So, but it, as well, if, if the project is small enough, like you could make a new Zlib or libpng from scratch with the same interface in Rust, it, it's doable. Like it's a few months of work, but it's doable. Is it a good idea? Is it uh, cost effective to do that? Maybe not. Because then you have to convince people to use your project. Even if it uses the same interface, like, I don't know, coming up to a distribution and say, OK, I have this library that has the same ABI as this one, so you have to propose the alternative. And they will say, what the fuck are you doing? Uh, we already have libpng. Yeah? The, the switch from libjpeg to libjpeg turbo went well? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was this one, yeah. It's a good point. So yeah, th there are some parts of code that should be uh, interesting for that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, somewhere in your presentation, you say um, you're talking about the most efficient uh, way uh, in finding the error. Uh, hmm. Could you please say again what is the most efficient way uh, to finding uh, the errors in the code when you're software? Uh, fuzzing. It's it's a kind of software that that like inserts faults into the input data and tries to trigger crashes in the in the software. Yeah, you mean that uh, you should use the software and then check uh, look for uh, errors in the uh, software. Yeah. Yeah. Like ba basically, fuzzing is an automated way to find bugs. Mm -hmm. I I do that even on new projects. Like even if I write my own parsers in Rust and they're supposed to be safe, uh, I still found some things, but. I would not have found them by doing a code audit that would take hours. At some point, I it's really easy for a fuzzer to find like the, the, the easy stuff you missed. Like, OK, there was this thing I found in one second. I did not have to do a code review or whatever. I just found the issue. And if you let the thing like run for days, maybe it will find other issues. But it's not a proof. If it does not find anything, it's not a proof that there are no bugs. Then you can get into other stuff like formal proofs. And I do not mention that because it's still a bit contentious issue because people are, do not agree exactly on we, what is a formal proof and what we want to prove. Like, what do we want to prove on a parser? Like, that there's no uh, overflows, that kind of thing? No, no off by one? Maybe the mo most kind of bugs? And those could be proven with, uh, with Norman Rust. I'm waiting for some other work that people do, like simulating Rust code. It should be quite interesting. OK. Thank you. Mm.